Today we welcome Tori Brown, the designer of Votes for Women, a fun and interesting game about the fight to give America's women the vote in 1920. Join us as we discuss this game, the process of designing, and board games in general here today on Legendary Tactics. All right, so I'd like to welcome Tori Brown to Legendary Tactics to uh, chat about your first design, Votes for Women. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes. And it, I have to say, I've, I've played Votes for Women a few times. I really like it. I think it's a really fun uh, game. It's, it's, uh, and it's uh, in a very playable uh, format and very playable time frame. And I love those little green check marks and the red X's. They are awesome. I mean, there it communicates so much, right? Like sometimes you just have red discs, green, right? Sometimes right, sort of shorthand kind of pieces in a game. But this I really do think is just on theme in a way that um, makes my brain happy. Yes, it's just so satisfying putting them on the board. <laughs> so that's great. Um, so t tell us a little about a little bit about yourself, your history with board games, and and what led you to eventually become a published designer. I'm not even sure. It's kind of amazing. Um, I am. Uh, I live in Washington D.C. I have worked in politics. I care deeply about issues, both you know, near and far. Um, worked on all kinds of progressive issues, from the women's rights movement to um, labor and um, some sort of you know general quality of life, raise the minimum wage, right? Do all of these things. And so from movement politics, um, I've really sort of earned or you know, gained a respect for not just the work that, you know, I see happening today, but the work that's happened um, over, you know, these centuries of the American project. Me and board games, I'm a pretty light gamer. Um, you know, grew up, uh, you know, the life and some monopoly, um, big trivial pursuit family. I think that that is sort of mostly where I had gravitated. And you know, I have copies of Carcassonne and I love a ticket to ride, right? Real light, easy to learn, easy to play kind of games. But somewhere along the line, things just sort of got a little more complicated. I think around the pandemic, picked up Watergate, picked up 1960, again, sort of staying on theme in my interests. But, um, you know, getting more complex. And I think playing 1960 and Jason Matthews um, version of the um, presidential election between uh, Kennedy and Nixon, sort of, again, <laughs> did something in my brain. And I think the probably most important key or, you know, the, the um, keystone for me becoming a published designer is that I've known Kevin Bertram, my publisher for over 20 years in a very <laughs> DC fashion. It's not what, you know, it's who, you know, <laughs> and he had published shores of Tripoli, this wonderful game about the Barbary pirates and the first Marine incursion um, in a, uh, America is a very young country, high quality, beautiful, playable game. And he was looking for his next theme. And and as I am nerding out on 1960 and thinking about the coming um, centennial, right? It was we America celebrated 100 years of the 19th Amendment in um, August of 2020. These sort of forces combined in the most fantastic way. Then a lot of Google Docs and um, uh, Dropbox folders and research and crying and play testing and more cry and what's all of this right? um, process. Finally, games were released to Kickstarter backers in December, and we are waiting on the rest of the first printing to hit the fulfillment warehouse, and it'll go to retail stores, it'll go to folks who have ordered through the website, and we're hoping to do enough and create enough buzz and have enough positive reviews and my interviews out there to get a second, third, fourth printing and um, really hope that the game goes wide, um, and that would be great. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So, um, so how did you come up with the idea of, of votes for women as a game? I mean, that's a, a it's a very unique theme. I, you know, when I, when I, I saw it, I actually, um, Mr. Bertram, uh, had let me know that it was in the pipeline and uh, I thought, wow, that's, that's a unique theme. And I love how board games are kind of doing that these days or branching out from, we're not just doing Eastern front in world war two, 
uh, endlessly. We're trying new things, but how did that start? Eastern Front in World War II is very popular for a reason. And there are people that will devote every hour of playtime to every facet of that conflict. And, you know, like you play what you want to play, play what you like to play. But there is, it seems like an appetite for more and varied, for different time periods, for different kinds of conflict or struggle. And I think that's where it felt like Votes for Women really made sense. And, you know, from a movement background, it was hard to conceive of how do you play a movement. The, I think the piece that became, um, you know, sort of playability was the ratification vote was this period from 1919 to 1920 where congress had sent the legisl- had sent the uh, amendment to the states and states were voting up and down and you know it's asymmetric which also had really great appeal to um, you know for uh, board game play and i think makes it sort of unique um, you know it took 36 states to ratify if 13 states had opposed the 19th amendment it wouldn't be the 19th Amendment. It would be on the, the, um, the cutting room floor, as it were. Um, so there was just these pieces of like that math of the ratification vote and how do we tell a story of the 70 years before that? And when I think about politics of how is power being built across the country? How are people being convinced and legislators being moved and stories being told and speeches and books and all these things um, that then sort of at the moment of, um, you know, it, of, of that vote creates winning conditions. And so, um, you know, it was uh, the, the constitution did me a solid and under article five by creating these asymmetrical um, sort of uh, uh, conditions for, for victory. And that the, um, the, I think the full scale of um, research that was available, the archives that are um, are open, the beautiful art, right? Looking through all of these, you know, the Library of Congress, National Archives, states have all of these. That became, like, I bet this would be really beautiful to play on a table, right? Like, so seeing it come together because of this artwork, because of, um, you know, the, the primary documentation that really helped, I think, formulate my, right, this is a deck of cards, right? Like this, there's so much beautiful, good stuff. All right. So card driven map, power cubes, ratification, right? Like these sort of the research really fed into the mechanics. Yes. And you based it on 19, your experience in 1960, I guess, was that? That's uh, right. Did that yeah. just fall into place naturally? Or was it like you were tried a few different approaches, a few different design ideas? No, I, then, it, yeah. Right. So 1960 uses the electoral college, also a gift of the constitutional framers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and it is, you know, each state based on population has a certain amount of um, a point value, right? And when you're running for, con- for president. So it felt like the ratification battle uh, was different enough, right? Because it's just one state, one vote in that sense that 36 states, no matter how big or small, vote for ratification, um, that that differentiation would help, right? So folks familiar with 1960, but wanting, it doesn't, you know, it's not just a skin, right, on 1960. 1960 uses what the media tracks and some of those, right, like that we sort of eschew and I think streamline and in a way, right, with this newer, different theme, hoping to attract newer, different gamers, right? So it becomes a little bit lighter in complexity. And, you know, I think some people see this as a gateway game, right? How do you get someone into a bit of a heavier theme, but not have to have them sit there for three hours while you read a binder full of rules, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right? So, yeah. um, so I think slimming down 1960, and Jason was really helpful in this as a senior play tester, right? It's not like I you know, just took 1960 and you know, lopped the top half off, right? Like how, how would it work for this scenario? How would it work for this theme? And then sort of building some complexity back in, right? Cause it's not just the map and the power cubes. There's other things happening that drive power. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's good. And so how did the, you're working with uh, uh, Jason Matthews and some others, I'm sure. So overall, how did the design process go? How did Kickstarter go? What did you like? What did you dislike? <laughs> Sounds like it was quite a dramatic three years for you. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of waiting. I'm kind of impatient. Um, so the Kickstarter, so I think 
you know, the pandemic hits in what, March of March 2020, 2020. Yeah. Um, you know, the game idea had sort of been noodling around, like, wouldn't it be great in, you know, in August to, to have a, a, a suffrage game? Turns out it doesn't really work like that. It takes a little more than a few months to sort of put together. So I start my research probably in earnest, thinking not along the lines of, you know, a map building power, right, for this ratification vote in May. And the Kickstarter coincides with the centennial, which is August 20th. So we had, I think, the map, we had right, the real basic pieces for the Kickstarter, but we didn't have a rule book. We didn't have full components. We, there was, uh, it was rushed. It was, right, like trying to meet this peg rather than, I think, you know, my publisher learned a lot about coming to Kickstarter in a timely fashion. And I was like, most folks were super understanding, oh, like, keep working on it. I'd rather it be a good game than a game that comes immediately, but not everybody, um, you know, and that's the game of Kickstarter, I guess, and the way that it's turned into in a lot of ways, um, you know, larger publishers use it as a marketing device. The game is done. Here's all the stuff, buy it and we'll deliver it to you where people were really actually helping fund development of the game. It was the Kickstarter funds that helped the um, playtest process. We printed out a hundred playtest copies, sent them to folks, not only sort of here in DC, women's history types, you know, sort of that the sort of theme experts, but then to a lot of gamers, folks that were part of the Shores of Tripoli playtesting or folks that had signed up that Kevin as the publisher had um, interacted with in various capacities. So that, I mean, and that components, I think I, do I have? Yeah, it looks, the playtest kit looks oh, nothing wow. like how yeah. the, <laughs> uh, the map is totally different. It was actually kind really? of startling to come. Well, I mean, it's still a map of America. So, yes. you know, like it's only going to be Couldn't that change that much different. about that. But yeah, but it's super bright, right? Yeah. Like the tracks were a lot more, I'm trying to like see if I'm holding yep. it right, um, right? Sort of spelled out, which just became too much track management yes. right like you see the yeah. early iteration of the congressional track um yeah. you know some of these right pop out of the states that were going to be too big for checks or not right so yeah you know a lot of it but then none of the um you know we didn't have the the numbering for the oppo bot right like um right so that's just like you know as a as an artifact yes. of <laughs> a historical process. document <laughs> yep folks that, you know, what we did have for the rule book, right? This isn't clear, that isn't clear. So that writes some stuff back to the drawing board. And this early copy doesn't have the state cards, the strategy cards. Um, I think buttons were only re-roll. We weren't then to a sort of button economy just yet, right? So we, using Kickstarter funds, able to not only print these, you know, and I don't, have any of the, I don't seem to have any of the components, um, but um, get things, you know, sort of, the feedback from playtesters was just invaluable in creating what I hope and think is a fun and playable game that's sort of easy to dive into and makes intuitive sense. And so, you know, that also then took some time and right and further tweaking and right this sort of idea of these strategy cards and that kind of a thing. And then um, I think we had final files to the print house in uh, China in early 2022 and this oh, point we're still wow. yeah we're yeah. still dealing with supply chain problems we're still dealing with right, the the slow boats from china got real slow and right um ports become a real right that our print house panda publishing had so many games printed of other right other games um and not anywhere to put them. There were not enough boats. There was not enough sort of the supply chain moving that they couldn't publish ours because there was nowhere to put them. And so having all of that, they were having COVID lockdowns. There's, you know, um, it just, oh, the rants I have about the supply chain, like I had no idea at the beginning of this process, I would have feelings about the supply chain. But then to, to say, watching the, so the cargo ship, we um, airmailed the early sort of set of games, um, uh, the Kickstarter backers, some early pre-orders, and the rest of this first printing came by boat. I was able to watch the cargo ship traverse the Panama Canal in real time because of satellite technology and there's like webshippingvessel.com. Um, so it became really cool to get a sense and to understand and to feel 
um, you know, that coming, somebody early on was like, I always wondered, you know, like I press re, you know, um, I'm always like, oh, when's my game coming? Is it coming? I wondered if publishers do that too. And absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> like, where yeah. are they now? When are they going to be there? Right. Like yeah. I am as excited to get them delivered <laughs> as I hope players were to have them delivered too. Yeah. Oh, that's good. And so, uh, yeah, so the, the, but the design process actually happened after the Kickstarter, or a lot of it you know, happened after the Kickstarter did. Yeah, it was sort of a skeleton, like it was sort of yeah. a skeleton. Um, yeah. And, you know, as unique, it, it is a unique title, but there is another title that is um, uh, Amabel Hollins from Hollenspiel has a suffrage game called The Vote. And so I'm not, I'm not the only one. I think there's vast differences. Um, you know, it, her game takes a lot longer to play. Hollenspiel um, titles tend to be, you know, really complex and meaty and um, you know, I think it's, it wasn't print and play, but I think it's like print on demand. Um, and so this, right, with our, with our game, like the components, all this stuff, like we're just never, we're just different models. Um, but I've seen a lot of folks say, you know, like I've played the vote because it came out in 2020 when the vote, <laughs> when people were celebrating the vote. Now I'm looking forward to seeing how this plays. So that's, that's interesting too. And I think there's room, there has to be room enough <laughs> in this wide and we're you know this uh wide hobby to have a couple right absolutely, yeah absolutely if we can have 85 games on the western front yes <laughs> yeah exactly we can make room for a few a few games about uh, women's the women's suffrage movement so, so yeah. um so now there's a lot of things this game covers 72 years of history how do you choose from the events the personalities to boil it down into a single deck of cards, or I guess in this case, there's two decks of cards, one for each side, but, but even then you still have to boil it down. How do you make those decisions? It's like choosing your favorite child, which I don't have yeah. any children. So like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, it, it, some early advice that Kevin gave me as I was doing research and trying to build these decks, decks out um, was a sort of, I guess, you know, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, I started with a Wikipedia page and like, I'd already had all this knowledge in my head and all this sort of fun and different stuff. Um, but to sort of like start with as stripped down of a, you know, a story, a narrative about the proceedings and the sort of key marks and that kind of stuff, right? Like to, and that's the basis for my spreadsheet or is that sort of, you know, here's, here are these, you know, sort of core events, here are related people, here's, you know, interesting developments. And then sort of, uh, and then I fleshed out really wide, <laughs> I went like real deep and real, um, and then sort of had to contract back because it couldn't just be the Wikipedia story, right? Like that's the one people get in school. That's the one that tends to be like, these old white ladies got everyone the vote and hooray. And that is not, right. I also really benefited from uh, emerging, I think academic research on other women that were involved, right? Diverse voices, folks from you know, across the racial spectrum on um, the income lines, right? That it wasn't just, you know, there, there were a lot of right, like middle-aged white women that um, middle, either high income or whatever, right? But I wanted to make sure that this game, right? So then comes in my sort of personal philosophy that like everyone knows who Susan B. Anthony is. So there is no Susan B. Anthony card in this game. There is a Susan B. Anthony gets indicted for illegally voting in Rochester, New York card. And that has its own sort of like value because of the publicity and all the folks that were paying attention to it. Um, but that, you know, the folks that most people know, you know, late era um, Alice Paul is, you know, if, if you know the story of suffrage, you probably know about her, her militant tactics, her sort of way that she changes, um, you know, how things are happening. And so she and a compatriot Lucy Burns are sort of combined into one card that gives a little bit of that but that gives room for other women who are doing this work in lots of different ways. Um, there's this saying, and I see it on bumper stickers and, you know, t-shirts and that kind of a thing. And the saying is, well-behaved women rarely make history. And a lot of poorly behaved women really like this saying, right? Like by breaking the rules, I'm going to make history, right? Bull in a China shop, right? Like that, and the, it, the, the, for the, the slogan originates out of the suffrage movement that it's these well-behaved women that you don't hear about that, right, that are doing work, that are making things happen, but aren't going to be on the front page of the newspaper, aren't going to be at the center of a narrative that gets told. It's not that they're not making work happen. It's that they're not at the center of the narrative. And so finding some of those women that weren't 
loud and on the front pages, but still contributed um, enormously, became also a sort of philosophical point of pride in the game to make sure that new voices, new faces, new ways of thinking about the work that had to happen are perceived and understood by players. Oh, uh, yeah, because it's it's quite a an undertaking to to, to go through all of that history too. You know, it's a um, it's a it's an interesting process, I think. So. Um, so was there any nuance to the, the history or anything that really caught you by surprise or something unexpectedly fascinating that you stumbled across as part of this research? Well, the area that I knew the least about going in was the opposition, right? The yeah. same sort of like, <laughs> it was these like women that dot it done. And then there were some like angry men who said no, right? Like misogyny drives the narrative kind of a thing. And so, yeah, yeah, right. Like that, <laughs> that was a part of it. Um, but there were a lot of women who opposed suffrage for a lot of different reasons, right? And we see in the deck, in the opposition deck, a lot of women who opposed because they were rich women who were enjoying their position in society and didn't want to upset the apple cart and fought against suffrage actively in speeches and in meetings with senators and petitions, right? Like they did work to keep the vote out of their own and other other women's hands, right? Like everyone is allowed to not vote, but then to not want it for other people, right? But to dig deeper into that, I think was really interesting. And you know, there's some overlap with the way that Southern women were um, coming to grips with the Civil War, what they lost, for very little gain. And they began, um, you know, this sort of like myth, this, this lost cause myth that they were fighting for a way of life in the South, right? And oh, that way of life is only possible because you've enslaved a race of people. Um, but, you know, it's, they tell themselves this story because psychologically, how do you deal with the death of your husband, your brother, your sons? And, you know, they took, right, these daughters of the Confederacy, they took that sort of emotional, turmoil and turned it against suffrage. And so understanding, you know, where that comes from. And then there were women like Emma Goldman, who was this radical anarchist who thought the vote was a bunch of hockey. The system would never come down, right? Revolution would never be achieved through the vote. So it was a, a, a distraction. It was a, you know, a waste of time. We should not be fighting for the vote. We should be fighting for full out revolution. And so, right, like, I also really love that. <laughs> so that, right, like being able to dig into um, the opposition into the wide variety of people that stood athwart and refused to support or actively, you know, fought against was also like new to me. And I think is important as we think about the work to do today to move progress society along that like this backlash is always fomenting and that like every force and every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And like, it's, I think, is illustrative of current social politics because we still see folks we would say like you're fighting against your self-interest but people have lots of interests on lots of different lines and to pretend that they don't exist to say you shouldn't do that rather than like what do i need to do to move around to undermine to whatever um i thought the the nuance of opposition to suffrage was um was fascinating yeah oh that's interesting yeah because it's not a a side that necessarily gets a lot of press, you know, there's, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, just the way history is, is told sometimes in the classroom, you know, by so, the victor, right? Isn't yeah. history told we, by yeah. the victors? Yeah, Which exactly. Suffrage definitely um, is affected by that as well. Women like um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and a woman named Matilda Gage wrote a book called The History of Woman Suffrage. And it was like a seven part tome that they've created, like they got all these different people to send in clippings and all that. They wrote the book on, on <laughs> suffrage history. And that became the basis for a lot of the sort of like great woman theory of suffrage, right? That, and there's a woman named Lucy Stone who was active in the 1860s, 70s and 80s. And she was invited to provide manuscripts and to contribute to this. And Lucy Stone says, no, history will know, history will understand. I don't need to manipulate and to right, tell my own story. I'm like, not very many people know who she is now. <laughs> yeah. And so it's just right, like, um, you know, literally the idea that Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton created suffrage out of nothing 
was a wholesale creation that they created out of very little. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, you know, it, fascinating as far as who tells the story of, of our politics and our times. Yeah. So speaking of telling stories, um, in, in a way, board games can tell a great story. What, what's the, what lessons and what message are you hoping that people take away from your game Votes for Women? I think there's an amount of like, these are interesting people and interesting times overcoming the civil war, you know, the Spanish, the Spanish flu was a racial construction. It was the great, the world pandemic flu um, that started probably in the Midwest, but they called it Spanish flu for racist reasons. Um, Right. But so there are all of these things and like society changing very quickly, right from 1848 to 1920, the industrialization of America, the over like um, immigrants, right, that start flooding the United States, flooding is probably also a racist construction, right, but like, <laughs> and not just in Eastern cities, but right, hitting the Midwest and the way that all of the, and then industrialization, the way that all of these forces are changing what people think of as America, people thinking of race and gender and class and um, in our times and where it, all sort of feeds. And so hopefully you see that through these cards, that there are all of these different forces at play that are creating seismic shifts that create this opening for women to, you know, no longer be barred from the ballot box. And I hope that through that, they think about today. And, you know, in my designer notes, I talk about, I hope people enjoy this game, have a lot of fun, like playing it, and that it sparks this idea of doing things together that we often feel powerless in our society, that we are just one person, we don't know what to do, we don't know how to do it. The the forces of opposition are overwhelming. The status quo is immutable, but it turns out that there are a lot of us and there are the power that comes from people and social movements is sort of all that's ever changed things for the better and that we can and must join together to to make a change and that they think about joining an organization on whatever they care about i like if you really hate the 19th amendment then like join a club and try to repeal it do it (laughs) right like yeah what it's a sort of very nonpartisan answer for a very partisan person um but that you know whether it's your kids school the water that you drink what your paycheck says, all of the, right, you know, what's in your hair dye or in your food, right? All of these things are not just sort of facts of life. Someone made a decision about these things. Someone else can make a better decision. And when we get together, we move those decision makers. We create power. I mean, and to think about the way that the suffrage movement, like these women couldn't say, do this or I won't vote for you. They didn't, right? And like, you know, when anything sort of ridiculous happens in DC, a lot of politicians are like, well, that's why you have to vote in November. Like, that's why you have to blow up a phone switchboard now. That's why you have to sit in an office. That's why you have to show up at a town hall meeting. That's There's all of this range of work. And these women were doing that, right? They didn't have the ballot in November, but they had picketing in front of the White House. They had speeches on street corners. They had all of this stuff that they create, invented, even just like wearing a button was something suffragists invented. And we think and take for granted now, right? What can we do even with our access to the ballot box that creates change that brings us together to express power to, to move the country forward? Yeah, oh, that's great. So, so it's, a, it's a great balance between uh, the history and the game. So what would you say to history buffs in order to get them to play your game? What would you say to gamers to get them interested in the history? Well, I think the first sales pitch to both groups is it's fun to play. It's a good, right? It's a nice way to spend an hour or so of your time. I think everybody sort of, that's right. Like, and there's so many um, ways people can spend their time. I mean, I do it just mindlessly scrolling through things on my phone, right? And all of a sudden all this time is gone, right? So sit down, play because it's fun and interesting and it's tense and it's rewarding and it's right, all of these things. I think to history, uh, to historians, right, or folks that care about the history, right, to be able to feel like you're living through history, like you are experiencing the civil war and what does that mean for the issue I care about? And then what does it mean to attract farmers to your cause in Midwestern states, right? Like, um, right, to, it's an opportunity to live through history. Um, and, you know, certainly with the, um, 
the inserts into the game, the like compendium of stuff that I demanded be in Which the game. Which was so neat, actually. Oh. You, don't, <laughs> you get to pick up all these historical documents and hold them in your hand as part and, of the experience. Right, not every historian, maybe lots of historians get to do that, but not every history lover gets to hold in their hand, you know, a, um, a voter registration card from 1920 or read the, um, the Daily Bugle's coverage of Sojourner Truth's speech or, right, like all of these, they hold a Spanish language flyer from the 1912 campaign in, in California. Um, so I think, right, the idea of um, have fun, live through history, Right, and think about how our history reflects um, our present for um, for historians, and then for gamers, I think giving a new theme a try, ex, you know, um, engaging with new designers. Right, if folks are concerned about not stagnation, but of the same stories being told. Right, I hope that folks see by supporting titles like Votes for Women it shows to other publishers that there is interest and appetite and a way to make different kinds of stories still fun and engaging and replayable. And, um, and I think that that's been um, an interesting sort of piece. The other thing that I found really interesting about talking to gamers about the game is you can play it with your daughter or your wife, right? And no, I'm sure there are plenty of gamers who see gaming as an away time, me time. You know, I can be released from my familial obligations. But I, there's this really nice quality about folks wanting to share their hobby with partners and family members who may not be interested in the kinds of themes they've been playing. And is this a theme that brings loved ones to the table? I, I hope so. I think it's weird if you like force someone who doesn't want, I don't, I don't think any, like, <laughs> yeah. they're still kind of nerdy and history and like, right? Like there's still, it's not universal. It's not, you know, there's some really neat games out there that, you know, are beautiful and are interesting and fun to play. Um, you know, this is still a war game. This is still struggle and politics and power. Um, but if you've been looking for something that you think, you know, uh, someone, you know, might, you know, might be interested. This is because it's so starkly different from a lot of existing themes. Let's say, give this yeah. one a shot. Yeah. Oh, that's good. And now um, as a designer, as a published designer, what, did, what advice would you give to other designers like yourself to, looking, maybe they've got an idea, maybe it's a, a theme that hasn't been covered before or, or whatever, just uh, what, what, what advice would you give? What would be uh, some ideas that you can give them? Well, ask all of your college friends if they are game publishers first. <laughs> yep, that work, that helps. <laughs> right, uh, Nepo Baby, I think is part. I got it. You know, not related, but certainly right. Knowing some, I think, but I just to acknowledge my privilege in having been asked to pitch a game. Right, I know that that is not the normal sequence. But I would say, right, like try, try again. Right, this long time period it took me. Right, that whatever you can do in that process to make the game stronger, more interesting, be open to not even criticism, but ideas and feedback and, you know, take the feedback that makes sense and let go what doesn't, right? Only a designer has a vision that, you know, other folks might not have a full sense of. And so just as you should be willing to hear folks' ideas, you should be able to, you know, take what makes sense. And I think, um, you know, there's this amazing community that I've, I did not know anything about um, when I started this. And I think, you know, a lot of it has been through people like Kevin Bertram and Jason Matthews and Liz Davidson and some of the, right, that like the community is a remarkable asset in board game design and asking folks about their opinions, asking, you know, whether to be on shows or to contribute to show, right, whatever it might be, um, that the, the community is a huge asset for new designers and to be an active part of the community, to give feedback to others. You know, I have a little bit of a back channel with Taylor Schuss, who is the designer of um, a Stonewall Uprising, and it's a gay rights movement game. Right. So we have some similarities of like political progressive movement games. Um, Stonewall Uprising there are no, op there's opposition, but there are no like named figures, right? There were lots of people in the seventies and eighties who were trash, 
Uh, but Taylor has this significant philosophical point that you don't, as playing, you know, the man aren't going to identify and see, right, any of those people. In my game, I'm like, look at this moment right here, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, um, and so, like, I am really just curious. And so we talk about how we each came to that decision. I think we would be great on a panel together if you have anybody out there that's, like, um, planning conferences. Um, but so, right, being able to exchange ideas and to right, support. I, I think maybe there's a reality where I feel threatened by another movement movement game and like oh no right but that is not this this reality I want Taylor's game to succeed and hope that mine also does and um, that we are creating space for each other and for new voices telling new stories um, that folks can resonate with whatever their gender sexual orientation race yes oh that's great now as part of that design process was there any anything you had to let go of any mechanic or an event card you just you you shed a tear when you realized it had to be cut. <laughs> so many tears. Oh yeah. I, think I I really struggled with a historical gameplay. How are you going to have reconstruction before or without the Civil War? How are you not going to let Wyoming be the first state to um, well, it, technically New Jersey was the first state to let women vote in, before 1807, but like, you know, and technically Utah passed it first, but their first election was after like, oh, the, the depths in my mind, the brain worms of this, but popularly Wyoming first place, you know, that had um, let women vote. How are you like, but aren't some of these sequences, what happens first, right? History isn't the history, right? And through, I think some more plays of 1960 and through right like what is fun about games <laughs> what is interesting about right just having to come to grips having to think about overly prescriptive design prevents players from exploring from in, do, right like it just i needed to let go and let happen Right. And I, I it's, it's for the benefit. I think, you know, Kevin and I had so many conversations about this, like, but I have a list here and this is the, the numbers in which the states ratified, like, here's the order, right? Wisconsin went first and right. And we end up using some of that, um, the state cards that you, you know, draw at the beginning of each, um, or if you gain power, um, you can earn these cards and it has great benefits to, um, to the player. It, um, those, states were selected based on the order by which states uh, ratified, right? So the first two states, that kind of a thing. Um, and, right, so I was able to like get some of my data in there, um, but it wasn't, um, you know, I just had to let it go that it didn't matter for the game that Wyoming went first and whatever order, you know, people gather that, gain that power in is how, why it's a game and not yes. a textbook. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. And so uh, the last question for you, what's next for Tori Brown? What's, uh, are there any other games you're working on that you can kind of let us know about? Or did this, did this experience just say, okay, that's it. I'm done. I've had that experience now. Or are you, you know, a little column excited? A, now, a little column A, a little column B. Like for a while, um, it was like until games are delivered, I'm not thinking about a single other thing, right? Like all I care about is the people, family members, friends, colleagues who paid money to the Kickstarter and want to make sure that, that gets delivered. So now that's happened. <laughs> And I think pre-orders and most of these um, retail orders will are going to come through any day now. Um, so there have been some ideas. There's been some good, the bad ideas. I think right that like things that sort of pop. Um, I, one idea on the sort of like I'm there are these buy nothing groups on Facebook where it's all about buy nothing, right? Hyper local gift economies. I'm right. Like what would a buy what would a, a buy nothing game a, a consumption game look like? But like. The whole idea is you don't buy anything. So I'm going to sell games. <laughs> yes. on that, right? Like, so that doesn't really jive. I think there's some interesting mechanics I wanted to play with that I can hopefully find some others. Um, an obvious follow-up that folks in my area that, you know, I've thought about is the equal rights amendment. So very famously, three years after the passage of the 19th amendment, the equal rights amendment was proposed and um, ultimately failed in 1971 um, that would essentially ban sex segregation and discrimination from the um, from the Constitution. And so is there a game where you 
play to win, right? Can, can you devise a different strategy in order to pass the Equal Rights Amendment? Um, there's other movements that I've been thinking about. Um, you know, I, there's a labor story, I think, right? And I've seen it in role-playing games and some amazing sort of coal strikes and some of that, right? What would, you know, would it be just broad, right? The labor movement, you got to win the five-day work week, you got to win the 40-hour, right? How do you, right, gather worker power and then translate that into improved living conditions for the vast majority of the American people? Um, or specific fights, right? The way that the farm workers organized and were um, driving boycotts on specific farm items, strawberries, um, grapes, Cesar's Chavez, Loris Huerta, like there's a really interesting story there. So I, that's the sort of like, I don't know how to tell stories that aren't driven by politics, by change, by trying to gather people together to, to improve, because um, we, because we can, we have to, right? Like it's, there's, there's not really an alternative. Um, we need to create changes. We need to create, you know, there's a lot of, you know, the 1% and the 99% kind of talk a few years ago, de decade ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and it's fundamentally like a political truism that, you know, in a world with such asymmetric wealth and power, that gathering people together to make change is the only way change will happen. And we have to make change happen. We cannot keep living on this trajectory, especially in the United States where our healthcare system is still so, so broken. And um, all of these other, you know, like the gun, the gun, the guns. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. So, um, so that's, I, I, if, if there's anything next for Tory Brown, it, I think it, it continues along a line of what like showing people victories that we've done it before it's not impossible it's not out of the question we can get it done and hoping that it moves them towards doing it now yeah oh that's fascinating all right well thank you so much for uh, joining us it's been so great to meet you and uh, i i can vouch for votes for women it, it it is a fun game it is an, a very interesting game and uh i'm really hoping it uh it goes viral you know in the best possible way and uh and leads to many more designs from tori brown so thank you so much again for joining us thank you so much for the opportunity this has really been great thank you